Thank you. Oh my goodness. Those testimonies are amazing. You may be seated. Wow. Really excited to be able to share with you this morning. I am passionate about several things in life, and I'm going to be sharing one of those passions with you this morning. But man, how I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you went out yesterday with one of the teams from Engage Austin? Wow, amazing, amazing. I see some of my team members. We were out at the UT campus praying for students. It was powerful. I love Engage Austin. I met Betty Swan last year at Zilker Park. That's a fireball right there, and we had some fun. And that's one thing I love about Engage Austin is we actually get to meet people in our body that maybe we aren't necessarily kind of bumping into on a regular basis and get to go out and share the good news. So what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. Well, today, I want to talk about partnering with the Holy Spirit in prayer. It's a passion of mine. It's something that I've been doing for 38 years. <laughs> and I want to share some of that passion with you. As I was preparing for this message, I was um, you know, doing a little research, and I came across an article that was printed in May of 2020, so two years ago, and it was in the Wall Street Journal. And the title of the article was The Science of Prayer. And there was a statistic in the article that was so fascinating to me, and it was looking at Google searches in March 2020. And prayer in 95 countries was one of the top things searched for on Google. And I just started kind of meditating on that and thinking about how God put inside of man just this innate desire to search for him in times of crisis. And we know as believers in Jesus that Jesus is the answer, right? (laughs) And so that's what I want to talk to you about today is prayer, Fervent, effectual, powerful prayers that shake heaven and change the earth. So I want to give us a little overview of what prayer is. So Tim mentioned in his introduction to me the DISC assessment. I love teaching people how to communicate. And prayer is a form of communication. (laughs) We communicate with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Prayer involves talking And prayer involves listening. Prayer is a two-way conversation that we get to partner with all of heaven and engage. And it's such a beautiful place of communion with Jesus. And so if we think about prayer, it's an intimate relationship. You know, I've been married to this man on the front row that's trying to take a picture of me, you know. (laughs) He's trying to be a good, like, Instagram husband right now. (laughs) I love it. 30 years. We just celebrated our 30-year wedding anniversary. Yeah, it's something to celebrate. And, you know, we dated for six years before that. We met in high school. We were high school sweethearts. And you know, in our 36 years of knowing one another, we've done a lot of talking. (laughs) We've done a lot of listening. We've done a lot of leaning in and learning about each other. It's a very intimate relationship. Our relationship is different today than it was 36 years ago. It's different today than it was 10 years ago. That is the same way with intimacy with the Lord. We're constantly growing, we're constantly learning, we're constantly exploring new areas of intimacy with Jesus. And I want to tell you that my prayer life looks radically different today than it did 38 years ago when I met Jesus. Radically different 
the first few years, I didn't even really like to pray out loud. I grew up in a family that we prayed over dinner, and my brother and I was more like, you know, God is great, God is good, you know, let's thank him for the food. Or God is great, God is neat, let's eat. You know, those were kind of the <laughs> prayers that we prayed in my household, and it wasn't really an intimate thing that was built into my, you know, family of origin. And so it wasn't really until college that I really got comfortable even just praying out loud in front of people. But prayer is a passion of mine. And over those 38 years, I want to tell you that I've been able to tap in to heaven and pray fervent, effectual prayers that availeth much. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And my desire is that every single one of us, that there is a fire lit inside of us today to realize that we too, no matter where we are in our journey with the Lord, can step in to that powerful prayer life and grow in intimacy with Jesus. Earlier when we were worshiping and we were singing about, you're so beautiful, I wanna see your face. I was reminded there was a year of my life in the 1990s that I think I prayed every single day to see the face of God. When you go after things in prayer, he will show up. When you knock and keep on knocking, when you seek and keep on seeking, there's a promise that the door will be open to you. I've got seven pages of notes and I haven't even looked at them. Let's, let's put the glasses on here. I really put some preparation into this. Um, you know, the more we spend time in prayer, the more we get to know our Heavenly Father the more we begin to dream his dreams, the more we begin to think his thoughts, the more we begin to have his desires deep inside of us. And you know, prayer is, it's vast, right? It's a multifaceted subject. Honestly, it would be impossible for me to even lightly touch on the subject in one sermon. I'm gonna do my very best. <laughs> There's so many different forms of prayer. There's thanksgiving, you know, worship, is a form of prayer, what we were just doing. There are petitions, there are um, groanings too deep for words, there's prayers of agreement, there's um, declarations that we make. We can pray in the Holy Spirit, there's intercession. There are so many aspects to prayer. You know, the disciples asked Jesus in Luke 11, 1, they said, teach us to pray. These were men that walked with Jesus, that spent their days with Jesus, and they said, teach us to pray. And you know, that gives me hope that prayer is something that can be taught and that we can learn. And that's what we're gonna do today. So I've talked about my passion of prayer. I've talked about just that great source of connection. Prayer is all about intimacy. It's a relationship that we have and it costs you something. It costs you your time. You know, I love all of the devices that we have in our lives, and I love that the iPhone now can tell you how much time that you spend on different apps. Have any of you looked at that little feature on your phone? I don't want to. <laughs> It can be eye-opening, guys. You know, I used to hear preachers used to talk about, you know, if you wanna see where your heart is, look at your checkbook. We don't write checks anymore, do we? <laughs> but you can look at your bank account. Well, let me tell you something. You wanna know where you spend your time? Look at your phone. Look at the number of, and you can set, I love it, you can actually set limits on different apps for yourself, not just for your children. <laughs> I encourage you to do it. I really do encourage you to do it. So prayer requires our time. It's a very intentional discipline, if you will, that we can build into our daily rhythms of life. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So when should we pray? I want you to listen to this list. These are not an all exhaustive list or all, you know, uh, full list, but these are some places that I found in the Word of God. Always, without ceasing, 
Anybody in the first Thessalonians class last week? We looked at chapter five without ceasing. At all times, three times a day, evening and morning and at noon, seven times a day, in the morning, a great while before day, at daybreak, the third hour of the day, about the sixth hour, the hour of prayer is the ninth hour, the evening, by night, at midnight. Those are some good times to pray. <laughs> and here are some places to pray. In the assembly, in the congregation, your closet, an upper room, a housetop, the temple, on the shore, a garden, on their beds, a desert place, in every place. When I look at that list, what I take away is that basically we should be praying all the time, everywhere, all day. When we're going about our business, when we're in our cars, when we're on our beds. You know, I have been laying next to this man for 30 years, and he has woken up many times praying. That'll startle you, and it kind of is like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I love where your spirit is right now. Brings a lot of peace. So I've mentioned a lot of aspects of prayer, but today what I want to talk about is intercession. And before you check out and think that's for the mature women of the church, because I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> we are all called to intercession. In fact, do you know where Jesus is right now? That's right. He is seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And if that's what Jesus is doing, that's what I want to be doing. So maybe some of you should be on our intercessory team. <laughs> and if you've been thinking that, let me tell you, here's your confirmation. You need to reach out because we do have a powerful team of intercessors that that is what they're going after. But I'm telling you, whether you're called to that team or not, every single one of us are called to a life of intercession. So what is intercession? It's a form of prayer. It involves talking to God. It involves listening to God, and it goes deep. It goes very, very deep. Intercession is literally the act of praying on behalf of other people. It's standing in the gap. It's literally intervening on behalf of another. You know, I've had several of you that have actually been interceding for me this week. Earlier in the week, I had a lot of that oak pollen going on, <laughs> and I felt covered as people were texting me, how can I pray? How can I cover you as you prepare for this meeting? And I want to tell you something, that intercessory prayer is an act of love. It's an act of love. We went out on the streets of Austin yesterday and we were sharing the love of Jesus. As I stood on that corner right in front of the student center at UT campus, I was praying that every single student that would walk through that place would feel the love of God, that they would step into peace like they've never felt before. We have that ability in our prayers to release so many things and I wanna talk about some of that today. So how do we make our prayers powerful? First of all, we need to know who we are. We are sons and we are daughters. And the word says that we are seated in heavenly places. Think about that for a moment. We're seated in heavenly places. Have any of you ever FaceTimed someone or been on a Zoom call or a Teams call? recently, right? So you may be sitting in your office or in your car or someplace, but you're literally in two places. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful example of our brains to be able to wrap around being seated in heavenly places. Our youngest daughter goes to school in New York, and I remember her freshman year, her dorm room literally looked out and she could see the Brooklyn Bridge and One World Trade Center. And I'd say, I want to see it. 
and she would turn her camera around. And I would be like, wow. I literally felt like I was there, right? We are in heavenly places. That is the promise of the Lord. And in that place, we have every spiritual blessing available in heavenly places. So we're sons, we're daughters, we're seated in heavenly places. That is how we pray. That is the place we pray from. And listen to this. We are called to co-labor with Jesus. And this, honestly, is one of the greatest mysteries of the Bible, and it kind of blows my mind thinking that the creator of the universe has called us, he's called me, he's called you to co-labor with him. And one of the most beautiful places that we get to co-labor is in prayer. That's where we can co-labor with the Lord, is in prayer. So that's where we're positioned That's where we stand before a righteous father and contend on behalf of others. And then we need to know who God is. (laughs) We need to know that he's gonna do what he says he's gonna do. You know how you understand all of the vast characteristics of the Lord? Read the book. (laughs) It's in here. We have to spend time reading the word of God. You know how many prayers are in this book? Paul loved to pray. Every letter that he wrote to the churches, there's prayers in these books. I loved it. Last Sunday, our senior leader, Joaquin, who's traveling, he's in London, right? Preaching, yeah, amazing. He prayed straight one of Paul's prayers from Ephesians. It was beautiful. So many ways to get to know the Lord and through that intimate relationship of coming into his presence and spending time. And we need to know what he says he's gonna do. He is our savior. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He is prince of peace. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. We need to know who Jesus is. Remember, we want to pray powerful prayers. We're seated in heavenly places, co-laboring with Jesus. We know that all of heaven is ready, right? And I want to talk about, so those are our positionings. There is an unseen battle. I see all of you, I see these chairs, we have worship, you see the instruments, the stage, but there is a host of things. (laughs) And we have invited angelic presence to fill this place. But let me tell you, over Austin, there is an unseen battle. And the word of God tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other, it's unseen. And let me tell you, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not of flesh and blood. They're not of this world, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. There are strongholds over this city that we have. I love this little beautiful image that Nick drew, that key to the heart. (laughs) We have weapons that literally will open up prison doors. Prayer is a weapon. It is a weapon that we have at our disposal. And you know, in Ephesians 6, we're told to put on the full armor of God because the struggle, again, is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And we're to put on the full armor of God. Do you know why? to stand. That's what the scripture says. Put it on so that you can stand in the day of evil. And remember, we're standing in heavenly places, contending on behalf of others. We gotta put on the belt of truth. This is the truth. I want you to do this with me. Let's, let's put on a belt of truth, come on. I taught a lot of children's church in my day. (laughs) We're gonna put on the breastplate of righteousness. 
Think about the breastplate. It covers our heart, our vital organs. There's a reason that we need to put on Jesus' righteousness, right? Come on, our feet, they're shod with the gospel of peace. Everywhere we step, we take peace, Prince of Peace, in to our city. Come on, next, my favorite one, one of my favorites, the shield of faith. Hold up your shield. This shield is to fight off every fiery dart that the enemy shoots at us. And let me tell you something, when we hold our shields together, Think about it. Think about the protection. Come on, let's hold our shields over us right now. And think about the covering as we join together every fiery dart falling to the left and to the right. We're to put on the helmet of salvation. Come on. Helmets on our heads. Do you know this is the battlefield? There is an all-out assault on the next generation for our identity. For our sanity, our children, I have never seen anxiety and depression, the things that are happening in our minds. Let me tell you something. We need this, the helmet of salvation. And the last piece, whew, this is the offensive piece. The sword of the spirit. Come on, hold up your swords, your phone, your Bible. Come on, hold it up. This is the word of God. And this is a mighty, mighty weapon. And we've got to get it in here. We've got to get it in our hearts. We've got to read this word. Thank you for playing along with my visual. <laughs> okay, there's individual prayers that we pray. And then there are corporate prayers that we pray. And I want to talk a little bit about the difference. So individual prayers. I mean, we pray for dreams. We pray for our family members, we pray for our friends, we pray for just our calling, <laughs> we pray for provision, for finances, all the things. These are wonderful, powerful prayers that we should be praying. And then there are some prayers that are so large that they literally cannot be answered for the individual. Have you ever thought about that? They can only be answered for the whole, for the body of Christ, for the context of community. And we see that in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. You know, this prayer is an apostolic prayer. It's an apostolic mandate. It starts with our Father. It's not my Father. It's our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want the kingdom of heaven to be implemented. Literally, we, we are asking for the blueprints of heaven to be implemented here on earth, here in Austin. That's what we were doing yesterday. We were going out just contending for our city, seeing that blueprint of heaven touch earth. That's what we're all about. <laughs> and when we pray those prayers, I want us to realize that those are sometimes really big, broad, sweeping prayers of, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. It's a powerful prayer. And we need to know what that looks like when it's answered, because you know what? Fuels us to pray more prayers, answered prayers. <laughs> That's why we share testimonies in this house, because it fuels us to contend more for others. And so if you think about that, what does that look like when we are praying those prayers over our city? When we see a guy who experiences healing, <laughs> takes his boot off, <laughs> and then takes off running, that's heaven touching earth. And let's pray that that pursuit, <laughs> that fire that he felt, that he would be just in love encounters with the king of kings. It looks like when your neighbor is in need of something and you're able to sit with them and listen and pray, that's what heaven looks like when it touches earth. 
when relationships are restored, when healing happens, that is heaven touching earth. And we need to see that. It literally causes our prayers to become laser focused. More ammunition, more strength to pray more, to contend. So I wanna talk, I've got a few more minutes here on revival history. <laughs> We've had classes here and our equip classes on revival history. My husband has taught several of those. Renee's preached an amazing message on revival history. There are two ingredients that in every major move of God that we have seen in history there are two things that are always present. One, repentance. Joaquin, our senior leader, preached an amazing message on repentance about three weeks ago. If you were not here, I encourage you to go online, on the podcast, on the YouTube channel, and watch or listen to that message. It's literally called Healthy Culture of Repentance. When we were in the green room that morning and we were praying as a team, I said, Joaquin, what are you preaching on? And when he said healthy culture of repentance, I'm telling you, electricity went through my body. And I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> it is a beautiful message. And so go listen. The second aspect when you look at revival history is prayer. Those two things have fueled every major move of God. And I am feeling the stirring inside of me. Anybody else? I'm like, why not now, Jesus? <laughs> why not here? I wanna tell you about a man named Daniel Nash. Some of you have heard this name. You know, when he was alive, which was in, um, the, he was born in 1775, he died in 1831. Many people did not know his name. But when you read about every account, it says that all of heaven and all of hell knew Daniel Nash. I know you've probably heard of Charles Finney. Daniel Nash was the intercessor that would go in to cities and towns before Finney's meetings and intercede on behalf of that city. He would rent rooms and he would get two or three people and he prayed those groanings too deep for words where he would literally be on his face in travail for the Holy Spirit to come and to move. There's a story about him renting a space and for three days, he and two other men were literally groaning on the floor. And the woman who had rented the space was kind of freaked out and she would go and she said, they're not eating and she would kind of open the door and be so terrified then she would close the door. And so she went to Finney and she said, you've got to come. I, I don't know what's happening. I'm afraid there's something really wrong. And she explains that they've been on their faces on the floor groaning for three days and they haven't eaten. <laughs> and his, his response is, oh, they've just come under the spirit of travail in prayer. They're fine. I heard another, I read another story about he would go out miles from meetings. He never attended meetings. He was praying the entire time. And it was in the winter, so there were really no leaves on the trees, and he'd gone about a mile from the meeting, and he was travailing so loudly that someone who literally lived another mile walked two miles to get saved because they heard this travail of this man, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit came on them. So they walked two miles in the winter to hear the message of the gospel. Man. You know, his gravestone, it's in upstate New York, it says, Daniel Nash, laborer with Finney, mighty in prayer. What an epitaph to, to literally sum up a life. Mighty in prayer. Mighty in prayer. What is fervent prayer? 
Because, you know, in James, it says, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. What is fervent prayer? It's literally the fire of God coming on the inside of you. The fire of the Holy Spirit in your belly. This fire, this emotion cannot be faked. It cannot be manufactured. It is intense. It's all-consuming. It's stunning. And it comes out of a true, deep love for God and a true, deep love for the lost. We need God to break our hearts for our city. Evan Roberts, the Welsh Revival. Any of you heard of his name? Amazing young man that literally was an intercessor, so responsible. He had a deep life of intercession. How about the Hebrides revival? Anybody heard of the Hebrides? Some islands off of Scotland. There were two sisters, Peggy and Christine Smith. They were in their 80s. 84 and 82, one was blind, one had arthritis so much she was crippled over, they could not go to worship services. So their cottage became their sanctuary where they met with Jesus and they contended day and night. And Peggy had a vision of young people flooding in to the churches and flooding into the kingdom of God. And she shared that vision and literally it sparked a revival that went all throughout those islands. Fulton Street, it's one of my husband's favorite revivals, the Fulton Street Prayer Revival. It happened in New York City in the Wall Street District on Fulton Street in the mid-1850s. Jeremiah Lamfer was the, the gentleman's name. For three months, he walked around passing out flyers inviting businessmen, people in factories, people in you know, their workplace to a noon prayer meeting. It's, he said he tried everything else. Why not try prayer? He said, prayer brings me peace. If anything, I'm gonna find peace here. For three months, he passed out flyers inviting people to a prayer meeting. The day comes, September 23rd, 1857, at noon. No one shows up. At 12.10, there is no one. At 12.20, it's just Jeremiah Lamfer. He's praying. At 12.30, five men walk in, and they pray. And listen to this account. It says that there was no fanaticism, no hysteria. From a human perspective, nothing extraordinary was happening. And certainly, there was no idea that this would begin one of the greatest revival movements in American history. Just six men quietly, earnestly seeking their God on behalf of their city. Yeah. I've shared these different examples because you know what? We're contending for a move of God and I don't want us to put God in a box. <laughs> Like, God, however you want to come. If you want it to look like groanings too deep for words, so be it. I yield. If you want us to sit in our seats and earnestly seek you quietly, so be it, God. I want to yield. I want to be a yielded vessel. This says, Jesus, come and have your way in this city. I want my heart to be so broken when I walk into H-E-B that I can't help but share the love of Jesus. Listen, we need to be so mindful of our assignment in this city. When we pull into a parking lot, we can partner with heaven we can pray as we step into a business that the peace of God would just come in. And it would be as if that man that had to walk two miles say, how, much, how must I be saved? Come on, I wanna hear next year at Engage Austin that that number of 
us that went out has doubled. <laughs> and the number of salvations of people literally stepping into the kingdom is we can't, I mean, the churches all over Austin are overflowing because of new converts. We have a part to play, every single one of us, a part to play in that. I feel it. I feel this moving of the Lord. There's a company of intercessors that the Lord is raising up in our city to pray that heaven would touch earth. It's not just one man. It's not just one woman. It is literally a company of believers, us joining hands getting on our faces and contending for our city. And I'm gonna end with this. We have an opportunity every third Wednesday, unceasing prayer. That community room is open for 24 hours and we're gonna be praying over our city. And I wanna encourage you, when you hear those announcements, show up, come and join with others to pray for our city. And I wanna just pray 2 Chronicles 7, 14 over us. Why don't you stand to your feet? It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let it be so. Let it be so, God. Amen. Amen.